One weekend, I finally decided to do something about our old mailbox that was falling apart, so I found myself shopping for a new one. The hardware store was bustling, but I managed to find a sturdy metal mailbox that looked like it could withstand anything. As I was checking out, the cashier mentioned that the previous owner of my house had returned several mailboxes over the years, claiming they were haunted. I laughed it off, thinking it was just a local urban legend. Back at home, I installed the new mailbox and went about my day. That night, as I was getting ready for bed, I heard a faint scratching sound coming from outside. I dismissed it as just the wind and went to sleep. The next morning, I noticed that the mailbox door was slightly ajar. I thought nothing of it, assuming I hadn't closed it properly, but as the days went by, the mailbox seemed to take on a life of its own. The door would open and close on its own, and sometimes I would find small objects, like pebbles or twigs, inside that I hadn't put there. One evening, as I was locking up for the night, I heard a voice whispering my name from the mailbox. I froze, my heart racing. I slowly approached the mailbox, and as I got closer, the voice grew louder. It was a woman's voice, pleading for help. I called out, asking who was there, but there was no response. I tried to open the mailbox, but it was stuck. I ran inside to grab a screwdriver, and as I was working to open it, I heard the voice again. This time it was a man's voice, angry and accusing. I finally managed to pry the mailbox open, and inside, I found an old yellowed envelope. Inside was a letter, written in a shaky hand. It told the story of a young couple who had lived in my house many years ago. The husband had been abusive, and one night, in a fit of rage, he had locked his wife in the mailbox. The letter ended with a warning, Beware the mailbox, for it is cursed with the spirit of the woman who is trapped inside. From that day on, I never used the mailbox again. I left it open, hoping that the spirits would find peace. But sometimes, late at night, I still hear the faint sound of a woman's voice whispering my name. A few years ago, I decided to buy a new high-tech cyber mailbox. I had read about it online, and the idea of having a mailbox that could protect my mail and packages from theft and damage seemed too good to pass up. The cyber mailbox was sleek, shiny, and had a digital lock that only I could open with a special code. It also had a built-in camera and motion sensors that would alert me if someone tried to tamper with it. The first few weeks with my new cyber mailbox were great. I received my mail and packages without any issues, and the notifications I received from the mailbox's app were reassuring. But then, things started to get weird. One evening, as I was sitting in my living room watching TV, I received a notification from the mailbox. It said that someone had tried to open it, but the attempt was unsuccessful. I checked the camera feed, but there was nothing there. Just an empty street. Ultimately, I shrugged it off and went to bed. The next morning, I received another notification. This time the mailbox said that someone had successfully opened it, but there was no package inside. Confused, I checked the camera feed again, but there was still nothing there. I decided to go outside and check the mailbox myself. When I opened the mailbox, I found a small black box inside. It had no markings or labels, and it was cold to the touch. I took it inside and opened it. Inside was a small silver key with a note that said, You're not alone. From that day on, strange things started happening. The mailbox would open and close on its own, and the notifications I received were cryptic and ominous. I started seeing shadows in my house at night, and I would hear whispers when I was alone. I tried to get rid of the mailbox, but it wouldn't let me. It would lock me out, and the key I had found seemed to be the only way to open it. I tried throwing it away, but it would always reappear on my doorstep the next day. I was afraid, but I still couldn't get rid of the mailbox. It had become a part of my life, and I couldn't escape it. I was trapped, and the mailbox knew it. It had me, and it wasn't going to let me go. One time I worked at the sports bar and helped pick out some of the decorations. One of the things we chose was this old mailbox. It was a rusty, weathered thing with a faded red paint job that looked like it had seen better days. The owner thought it would add a touch of rustic charm to the place, and I had to admit, it did look pretty cool hanging there on the wall behind the bar. But then, strange things started happening. At first it was just little things. The lights would flicker when someone walked by the mailbox. The beer taps would run dry for no reason. The jukebox would play songs that nobody had picked. And every night, when I closed up the bar, I could swear I heard a faint scratching sound coming from inside the mailbox. I tried to ignore it, but the incidents kept getting weirder. 
One night, I found a stack of old yellow letters stuffed inside the mailbox. They were all addressed to the same person, a woman named Elizabeth who lived in the building long before it had even been turned into a sports bar. The letters were all from a man named Thomas. They were filled with declarations of love and promises of a future together. As I read the letters, I felt a chill run down my spine. The writing was desperate, almost pleading. And then I saw the dates on the letters. They were all from the 1920s. I tried to tell myself it was just a coincidence, but then the scratching sound started again, louder this time. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as I slowly approached the mailbox. With trembling hands, I reached out and opened the little door. There, inside the mailbox, was a pile of bones. They were small and delicate, like those of a woman. And on top of the pile was a single, faded photograph. It was a picture of a young woman with a shy smile and a look of longing in her eyes. I automatically knew it had to be Elizabeth. I stumbled backwards, horrified. And that's when I heard it. A soft, whispery voice, like someone speaking from far away. Help me, it said. Help me find my Thomas. I ran out of the bar and never looked back. To this day, I don't know what happened to Elizabeth or her Thomas, but I do know one thing. I will never look at an old mailbox the same way again. I was an engineering major, and for our senior design project we had to come up with some kind of innovative new mailbox. The task seemed simple enough, but little did I know that this project would lead me down a path of terror and despair. As we brainstormed ideas, my team and I decided to create a mailbox that could be controlled remotely, allowing users to open and close it from the comfort of their homes. We thought it was a brilliant idea, but the professor seemed skeptical. He warned us that tampering with the traditional mailbox design could have unforeseen consequences. Ignoring his warnings, we forged ahead with our project. We spent countless hours designing, programming, and building our prototype. It was a sleek modern mailbox with a built-in camera and a secure locking mechanism. We were so proud of our creation, but that pride would soon turn to fear. The day of the presentation arrived, and we were eager to show off our innovative mailbox. As I stood in front of the class, I noticed something strange. The mailbox seemed to be breathing. It was subtle, but I could feel a slight vibration coming from within. I tried to ignore it and focus on my presentation, but the feeling of unease only grew stronger. As the presentation came to a close, I decided to open the mailbox remotely, just to show off one last feature. But as I pressed the button, a deafening screech filled the room. The mailbox exploded open, and a swarm of black, winged creatures poured out. They were like nothing I had ever seen before, with razor-sharp teeth and glowing red eyes. The creatures descended upon the class, tearing into flesh and bone. Screams filled the air as my classmates were ripped apart. I tried to run, but the creatures were too fast. They surrounded me, their wings beating furiously as they closed in. In that moment, I realized the professor was right. We had tampered with something ancient and powerful, something that should never have been disturbed. As the creatures came in closer, I could only wonder what other horrors lay hidden within the depths of our mailbox. I was an engineering major, and for our senior design project we had to come up with some kind of innovative new mailbox. But as I lay there, accepting my fate, I realized that some things are better left untouched. When I was in the fifth grade, we had to do this art project involving mailboxes. Honestly, I'm not sure exactly what it was supposed to be. The only thing I remember clearly is the mailbox itself. It was a rusty old thing, sitting at the edge of the school's playground, forgotten and neglected. It had been there for as long as anyone could remember, a relic from a time when the school still had a mail service. As part of the project, we were supposed to decorate the mailbox. Most of the other kids painted it with bright colors or covered it with stickers, but I had a different idea. I wanted to make it look like it had been there forever, like it was a part of the school's history. So I used a special paint that would rust and age the metal, making it look even older than it was. The project was a success, and the mailbox looked so real that no one could tell the difference between my work and the actual rust. But as the days went by, strange things started to happen. At first, it was just little things. The mailbox would be open in the morning, even though we had closed it the night before. Then, letters started appearing inside it, letters that no one had put there. They were old and yellowed, with faded ink that was barely legible. As the weeks passed by, the letters became more frequent, and the messages they contained became more disturbing. 
They were all addressed to the same person, someone named Sarah, and they were filled with threats and warnings. You can't hide forever, one of them read. We will find you. We tried to ignore the letters, but it was hard to do when they were appearing right in front of us every day. And then, one day, a new letter appeared. This one was different. It was addressed to me. You shouldn't have done that, it read. Now you've woken her up. She's coming for you. I didn't know what to do. I was terrified. I tried to tell the teachers, but they just laughed it off, saying it was all part of the project. But I knew better. I knew that something was very wrong. And then, one night, I saw her. It was Sarah. She was standing next to the mailbox, her eyes glowing in the darkness. She was looking right at me. I ran. I ran as fast as I could, but I could still hear her right behind me, her footsteps getting closer and closer. I never looked back. I just kept running, praying that I would make it out alive. To this day, I still don't know what happened to Sarah or why she was haunting the mailbox. All I know is that I never want to see that mailbox again. Whenever I was little, our grandmother had these little mailboxes at her house where she leaves surprises for me and my brothers whenever we come to visit. Each mailbox was painted a different color, and they hung on a wooden fence in her backyard. I remember the excitement I felt when I saw my name on one of them, knowing that grandma had something special waiting for me inside. But one summer, everything changed. Grandma had been acting strange for a while, and we all noticed it. She was quieter, more distant, and she spent a lot of time in her garden. She would just sit there, tending to her plants, barely saying anything. We still visited her every weekend, pretty much, and she still left us surprises in our mailboxes, but there was something different about them now. They were never quite what we expected, and sometimes they were downright odd. One day, I decided to sneak out to the backyard and peek inside my mailbox before Grandma had a chance to fill it. I carefully lifted the lid, trying not to make a sound, and peered inside. What I saw made my blood run cold. Inside my mailbox was a small, neatly wrapped package, but it wasn't a toy or a piece of candy. It was a tiny, withered hand, with a note attached that read, Don't tell anyone, or I'll have to take yours too. I stumbled back from the mailbox, my heart racing in my chest. I didn't know what to do. Should I tell my parents? Should I confront Grandma? I decided to keep quiet, at least for the time being. But every time I visited Grandma's house, I couldn't help but feel a sense of dread whenever I saw those little mailboxes. Years later, I learned the truth. Grandma had been suffering from dementia, and her strange behavior was a result of her deteriorating mental state. The little hand in my mailbox was a doll's hand, and the note was a manifestation of her paranoia and fear. But even though I now know the truth, I can't help but feel a chill whenever I think about those little mailboxes and the fear they once held for me. The town I grew up in had this yearly festival where, as part of an arts and crafts program, people could decorate these small paper mailboxes. It was a tradition that everyone looked forward to, a time when creativity and community spirit came together. But as I grew older, I began to notice something strange about the mailboxes. It started innocently enough. A few mailboxes would go missing after the festival, their decorations left scattered across the streets. People shrugged it off as a prank by some bored teenagers. But as the years went by, more and more mailboxes disappeared and the decorations became increasingly macabre. One year, I decided to investigate. I stayed up late on the night of the festival, hiding in the shadows, watching as people put the finishing touches on their mailboxes. That's when I saw it, a dark figure moving silently between the mailboxes, taking them one by one. I followed the figure, my heart pounding in my chest. It led me to an abandoned house on the outskirts of town, its windows boarded up and its yard overgrown with weeds. The figure disappeared inside, and I heard a faint sound, like the rustling of paper. I couldn't resist my curiosity. I crept up to the house and peered through a crack in the door, but what I saw chilled me to the bone. The figure was hunched over a pile of paper mailboxes, tearing them apart with its bare hands. Its face was obscured by a hood, but I could see its eyes cold, dead eyes that seemed to stare right through me. I stumbled back, my mind racing. What was this creature, and why was it so obsessed with the mailboxes? I didn't know, and I didn't want to find out. I ran back to the festival, my heart pounding in my chest. I tried to warn the others, but they just laughed at me, calling me crazy. But I knew what I saw. 
I knew that something was very wrong in our town. From that day on, I never looked at the mailboxes the same way again. They were no longer a symbol of community and creativity, but a reminder of the darkness that lurked just beneath the surface. And every year, as the festival approached, I couldn't help but wonder, what would happen if the creature came back? When I was a kid, I used to have this bizarre, recurring dream about mailboxes. In the dream, I would walk down a long, winding road lined with an endless row of mailboxes, each one looking more sinister than the last. The sky was always overcast, casting a gloomy shadow over the landscape, and the air felt heavy and oppressive. As I walked, I could hear whispers emanating from the mailboxes, like they were trying to tell me something. I would approach one of the mailboxes, my heart pounding in my chest, and reach out to open it. But just as my fingers touched the cold metal, I would wake up, drenched in sweat and gasping for air. This dream actually haunted me for years, and I never understood what it meant. But one day, when I was walking home from school, I saw a mailbox on the side of the road that looked exactly like the ones from my dream. I froze, my breath catching in my throat, as I stared at it. I don't know what possessed me, but I found myself walking towards it, my heart racing with fear and curiosity. As I reached out to open it, I heard a voice in my head telling me to stop, warning me that I was about to uncover something terrible. But I couldn't resist, I had to know what was inside. With trembling hands I opened the mailbox. At first it seemed empty, but then I saw a small, crumpled piece of paper lying at the bottom. I reached in and pulled it out, unfolding it to reveal a message written in a shaky, unfamiliar hand. Beware the mailboxes, it read. They hold secrets that should never be revealed. I dropped the paper, my mind reeling with confusion and fear. What did it mean? What secrets were the mailboxes hiding? Why did I keep having this dream? From that day on, I avoided the mailbox on the side of the road, but the dream continued to haunt me, and every time I walked past that mailbox, I couldn't help but feel a shiver of dread, wondering what dark secrets it held. Back in like fourth grade, our school put on a play, and I ended up getting stuck being a mailbox. I remember being so disappointed because I wanted to be a tree or a cloud, something more interesting than a mailbox at least. But no, I was stuck with the role of a mailbox. The play was about a small town where everyone knew each other, and the mailbox was the center of all the gossip. But all that boiled down to was me just standing there in my cardboard mailbox costume while the other kids ran around me, acting out their parts. It was during one of the rehearsals that I first noticed something strange. I was standing there, bored out of my mind as usual, when I saw a shadow move. It was behind the curtains, so I couldn't tell exactly what it was, but it looked strange. At first, I thought it maybe was just one of the stagehands, but then I saw it again, and it looked like it was getting closer. I didn't think much of it at first, but then the shadow started appearing every time we rehearsed. It would just stand there, watching us. No one else seemed to notice, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something wrong. One day after rehearsal, I decided to stay behind and investigate. I crept backstage, my heart pounding in my chest. As I got closer to the curtains, I could feel a chill in the air. I pulled back the curtain, and that's when I saw it. A dark figure, standing there, staring at me. I screamed and ran back to the others. When I told them what I saw, they laughed at me. They said it was just my imagination, and that there was nothing there but I knew what I saw. The next day, during the performance, I couldn't shake the feeling that the figure was still there, watching us. And then, during the final scene, the lights went out. There was a scream, and when the lights came back on, one of the kids was gone. We never found out what happened to him. The police searched the school, but they found nothing. Needless to say, the play was cancelled, and we were all sent home. However, I never forgot what I saw that day. And to this day, I still get a chill whenever I see a mailbox. Back in college, I took some BS creative writing elective where we barely did anything. At one point we had to write up a poem, and my friends and I tried to come up with the most ridiculous topics we could. I ended up choosing to write about a mailbox. Little did I know that this seemingly innocuous decision would lead me down a path of fear and paranoia that would haunt me for years to come. The poem I wrote was about a lonely mailbox that stood at the edge of an old abandoned road. It was a dark, dreary piece that described the mailbox's longing for letters that never came, and slow descent into madness. 
As I read it aloud in class, a chill ran down my spine, and I felt a strange sense of unease. After class, I dismissed the poem as just another silly assignment and thought nothing more of it, but that night, as I lay in bed, I couldn't shake the image of the lonely mailbox from my mind. I tossed and turned, unable to fall asleep, haunted by the eerie feeling that something was watching me. The next day I walked past a mailbox on my way to class, and I felt a shiver run down my spine. It was just a mailbox, I told myself, nothing to be afraid of. But the feeling of unease persisted, and I found myself avoiding mailboxes whenever possible. As the weeks passed, my fear only grew. I started to see mailboxes everywhere, their dark, gaping mouths mocking me, taunting me. I became convinced that they were watching me, watching for the perfect moment to strike. One night, as I walked home alone, I saw a mailbox standing in the middle of the sidewalk. It was the same mailbox from my poem, I was sure of it. I tried to walk around it, but it seemed to move with me, blocking my path. I broke into a run, but the mailbox was always there, just out of reach. I never made it home that night. The mailbox had claimed its first victim, and I was never heard from again. Now, whenever I see a mailbox, I can't help but shudder. They may seem harmless, but I know the truth. They're watching, waiting, and one day, they'll claim another victim. Sometime in middle school, our class took a field trip to a mailbox factory. The day was overcast, and a sense of foreboding hung in the air as we piled onto the bus, chattering excitedly about the adventures ahead. Little did we know, this field trip would turn into a nightmare we would never forget. The factory was old and dilapidated, with rusty machinery and dark corners that seemed to swallow the light. Our guide, a gruff man with a thick mustache and a gravelly voice, led us through the maze of conveyor belts and assembly lines, explaining the process of making mailboxes with a board detachment. As we reached the end of the tour, our guide turned to us with a sinister grin. Now, for the most important part of the tour, he said, his voice low and menacing, the testing room. We followed him into a large, dimly lit room filled with rows of mailboxes. The air was thick with the smell of metal and oil. Our guide gestured towards the mailboxes. These are the rejects, he said, mailboxes that didn't pass quality control. They're not quite fit for use, but they're perfect for our little game. He explained the rules. Each of us would choose a mailbox and open it. If it was empty, we would move on to the next one. If it contained a letter, we would read it aloud to the group. But if it contained something else... He didn't finish his sentence, but the implication was clear. We were all terrified, but none of us wanted to back out. We chose our mailboxes and started opening them one by one. The first few were empty, but then one of the girls screamed. She had found a letter, and as she read it aloud, we realized it had very disturbing material. The words were chilling, describing a deep despair and a desire to escape the horrors of this world. As we continued, more and more letters were found, each more disturbing than the last. They described various things, none of which I want to repeat. The stories were graphic and terrifying, and we were all on the verge of tears. But the worst was yet to come. One of the boys opened a mailbox and let out a blood-curdling scream. We didn't even see what exactly was in the mailbox, we just all ran for the door, but then it was locked. Our guide stood in front of it, his face twisted into a malevolent grin. Welcome to my nightmare, he said. You're never leaving this factory. We screamed and pounded on the door, but it was no use. The guide had planned this all along, and we were trapped in his twisted game. As the hours passed, we realized that our only hope of survival was to find the key to the door, hidden somewhere among the rows of mailboxes. The story continues, but the details become too gruesome to recount. Let's just say that by the time the police finally arrived, none of us were the same. We had seen things that no child should ever see, and the scars would stay with us for the rest of our lives. And to this day, I can't look at a mailbox without feeling a shiver of terror run down my spine. For a brief while back in college, I actually worked in this mailbox museum. It was a quiet, eerie place, filled with the relics of communication from a bygone era. The old metal boxes, with their rusted hinges and faded numbers, seemed to whisper secrets from the past as I walked by them. One night, I was tasked with closing up the museum. The sun had already set, casting long shadows across the empty halls. I made my way through the exhibits, checking each mailbox one last time before locking up. As I approached the end of the line, I noticed something odd. One of the mailboxes, 
particularly old one with intricate carvings, was slightly ajar. I reached out to close it, but as my hand touched the metal, I heard a faint whisper. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. Help me, the voice whispered. Please help me. I stumbled back, my mind racing. Was this some kind of prank? But the museum was empty, I was sure of it. I started to turn to leave, but the voice called out again. Please don't leave me here, it pleaded. I've been trapped in this box for so long. In the end, I couldn't ignore it. I approached the mailbox again, my hands shaking. I opened it wide, and a gust of cold air rushed out, carrying with it a sense of dread. Inside, there was nothing but darkness. Who are you? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. I don't know anymore, the voice replied. I've been here for so long, forgotten by everyone. I felt a chill run down my spine. This was no prank, no hallucination. There was something, someone, trapped in this mailbox. How can I help you? I asked, my voice trembling. Take me with you, the voice said. Let me see the world again. I hesitated. What if this was some malevolent spirit, some dark force? But the voice sounded so desperate, so lost. I couldn't just leave it here. I reached into the mailbox, my fingers brushing against something cold and smooth. I pulled out a small metal box, no bigger than my hand. It was old, the metal tarnished and worn. Thank you, the voice whispered, and I felt a sense of relief wash over me. I left the museum that night, carrying the mysterious box with me. I never told anyone what happened, afraid they would think me mad. But sometimes, late at night, I hear the whisper of the mailbox, thanking me for my kindness. And to this day, I keep the little metal box on my desk, a reminder of the night I freed a lost soul from the confines of the mailbox museum. When you're a government mailbox inspector, you see a lot of weird stuff. It's part of the job, really. Most of the time it's just the usual. Graffiti, damaged doors, the occasional prank. But every now and then, something comes along that makes you question your sanity. That's what happened to me last summer. It started as a routine inspection in a small quiet town. The mailboxes were lined up neatly, just like in any other neighborhood. But as I approached the last one on the block, I noticed something was off. The mailbox was old, rusty, and had a strange, almost organic growth on its side. It looked like a cluster of mushrooms, but they were a deep blood red. I took a closer look, and that's when I saw it. The mushrooms were moving. They were pulsing, like they were breathing. I took a step back, my heart racing. I'd never seen anything like this before. I reported it to my supervisor, who told me to keep an eye on it and report back if anything changed. So I did. I watched that mailbox every day for a week, and every day the mushrooms grew bigger and more vibrant. They started to spread, too, creeping along the mailbox and onto the nearby fence. Then one day, I saw it. A hand. A human hand, reaching out from inside the mailbox. I screamed and stumbled back, my mind racing. Was someone trapped inside? Was this some kind of sick joke? I called the police and they arrived within minutes. They opened the mailbox, but then there was nothing inside. No hand, no body, nothing. Just the normal mail and the strange pulsing mushrooms. The police told me it was probably just a prank, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more to it. I kept thinking about that hand, reaching out for help. After that, I started seeing things. At first it was just shadows out of the corner of my eye, but then I started seeing the hand again. It would reappear on the edge of my vision, just for a second, before disappearing again. I tried to tell myself it was just my imagination, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, that the mailbox was cursed. I quit my job soon after that, I just couldn't take it anymore. But even now, I still see that hand. It haunts my dreams, and I can't help but wonder if it's still out there reaching out for help from anyone who will listen. For some reason, when my brother was like 12, he got this idea in his head about wanting to be the world's first mailbox influencer. I never really understood it, but he was always a bit different from the rest of us. He would spend hours online, studying the different types of mailboxes and their unique features. He even started his own blog, where he would review different mailboxes and share his thoughts on the latest mailbox trends. One day, he came to me with a strange request. He wanted me to help him with a project that he said would change the world of mailboxes forever. I was intrigued, so I decided to help. 
little did I know what I was getting myself into. The project involved building a massive mailbox, one that would tower over the rest of the neighborhood. He had a vision of creating a mailbox that would be so impressive it would attract the attention of mailbox enthusiasts from all over the world. We ended up spending weeks building the mailbox. It was a mammoth structure, standing at least twice the height of a normal mailbox. It was painted bright red, with intricate designs and patterns all over it. My brother was ecstatic with the result. But as soon as we installed it, strange things started to happen. The mailbox seemed to have a life of its own. It would open and close at random times, and sometimes we would hear strange noises coming from inside it. My brother dismissed it as just a glitch, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. Then, one night, I woke up to the sound of the mailbox door creaking open. I looked out the window and saw a shadowy figure standing next to it. The figure seemed to be looking right at me, and I could swear that it was smiling. The next morning, the entire neighborhood was in a state of panic. Every mailbox on the street had been destroyed, and in their place were strange, twisted versions of the original mailboxes. My brother's mailbox was the only one that remained untouched. Since that day, I've never been able to look at a mailbox the same way again. Every time I pass one, I can't help but wonder if it's watching me, waiting for the right moment to strike. And as for my brother, he never spoke about his mailbox influencer dreams again. He just seemed to shut down, and he never seemed the same after that. I used to live and work close to a beach, and maybe it sounds a bit cliche, but it was really a stress reliever to go for long walks there. The sound of the waves crashing against the shore, the salty breeze in my face, it all had a way of washing away the worries of the day. But that all changed one evening when I decided to take a detour through a nearby neighborhood on my way back home. It was getting dark and the street lights were flickering on, casting eerie shadows on the pavement. As I walked past the rows of houses, I noticed something strange about the mailboxes. They were all identical, with a rusty red color and a small faded number on each one. But what really caught my eye was the way they seemed to be watching me. I shook my head, trying to dismiss the thought as a trick of the light, but as I continued walking, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. Every time I glanced over my shoulder, I could have sworn I saw one of the mailboxes moving, just slightly. I quickened my pace, my heart pounding in my chest. As I reached the end of the street, I heard a soft creaking noise behind me. I turned around, and my blood ran cold. One of the mailboxes was standing right in front of me, its door wide open, revealing a dark, gaping maw. I tried to run, but my legs felt like they were made of lead. The mailbox lunged at me, its rusty hinges screeching like a banshee. I stumbled back, tripping over my own feet, and landed hard on the pavement. The mailbox loomed over me, its door opening wider and wider. I could see rows of sharp, jagged teeth inside, and a long, slimy tongue flicking out. I screamed, but no sound came out. The mailbox lunged again, and this time, it swallowed me whole. I woke up in a cold sweat, my heart racing. It was just a dream, I told myself. Just a bad dream. But as I glanced out the window, I could see the mailboxes standing in the darkness, their doors creaking in the wind. And I knew, deep down, that it wasn't just a dream. The mailboxes were alive, and they were coming for me. One time in second grade, we had to write short fictional stories about a topic of our choosing. For some reason I went with mailboxes, I still have no idea why. I remember sitting at my desk, chewing on the end of my pencil, trying to think of something interesting to say about mailboxes. Suddenly, a shiver ran down my spine as a thought entered my mind. What if mailboxes were more than just simple metal boxes? What if they were alive? I began to write furiously, the words pouring out of me like a flood. In my story, the mailboxes were alive, and they would eat any mail that was placed inside of them. If you were unlucky enough to be delivering the mail, you had to be careful not to get too close, or the mailbox would snap its metal jaws shut, trapping you inside. I wrote about a mailman who was delivering a package to a particularly large mailbox. As he approached, the mailbox began to shake and rattle, its hinges creaking ominously. The mailman hesitated, but he had a job to do. He reached out to place the package inside the mailbox, but it was too late. The mailbox lunged forward, its jaws snapping shut around the mailman's arm. He screamed in pain as the mailbox began to shake him back and forth, like a dog with a chew toy. The other mailboxes in the neighborhood began to stir, their metal bodies creaking and groaning as they came to life. 
They started to move towards the mailman, their jaws opening and closing hungrily. The mailman was trapped, surrounded by a horde of hungry mailboxes. I finished my story just as the bell rang for recess. I put my pencil down and looked around the classroom. Everyone else was still writing, their heads bent over their desks. I felt a strange sense of pride in my story. It was creepy and weird, but it was mine. As I walked out to the playground, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me. I turned around, and there, standing in the corner of the schoolyard, was a mailbox. It was just a normal mailbox, but in that moment, it seemed to be watching me with its empty metal eyes. I shivered and ran off to join my friends, but I couldn't get the image of that mailbox out of my mind. From that day on, I always felt a little uneasy when I passed by a mailbox. I knew it was just a story, but in the back of my mind, I couldn't help but wonder if there was a kernel of truth to it. After all, who's to say that mailboxes aren't alive, just waiting for the right moment to reveal their true nature? I played the alto sax back in high school, and I remember there were these weird mailbox-like boxes in the band hall for some reason. They were old and rusty, with peeling paint and a strange, musty odor emanating from them. I never paid much attention to them, assuming they were just some relic from a bygone era. That was, until the day I stayed late after practice to work on a particularly challenging piece. The school was eerily quiet, with only the faint hum of the fluorescent lights overhead to keep me company. As I packed up my instrument, I noticed one of the mailbox doors was slightly ajar. Curiosity got the better of me, and I reached out to close it. That's when I heard it, a soft, raspy whisper that seemed to come from within the mailbox itself. Help me, it pleaded. My heart began to race, and I stumbled back, dropping my saxophone with a loud clatter. I told myself it was just my imagination, but as I gathered my things and hurried out of the band hall, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me from those mailbox-like boxes. Days passed, and I tried to forget about the incident, but the whispers haunted my dreams. I couldn't focus during practice, and my performance suffered. Eventually, I just couldn't take it anymore, and decided I had to investigate the boxes. What I found inside was beyond anything I could have imagined. Each box contained a small, faded photograph, and as I looked closer, I realized they were all pictures of... me. They were taken at various moments throughout my life, too. But the most chilling discovery was the message scrawled on the inside of each box. You can't escape your past. From that day on, I never played the alto sax again. I transferred schools and tried to start fresh, but the whispers followed me wherever I went. I knew, deep down, that I would never be free from the haunting presence of those mailbox-like boxes. Back in high school, my class used this CAD software at one point, and I remember one of the assignments was to build a model of a mailbox. It was supposed to be a simple task, something to help us understand the basics of 3D modeling and design. Little did I know that this seemingly innocuous assignment will lead me down a path of terror and paranoia. It all started innocently enough. I designed my mailbox, following the specifications given by our teacher. It was a standard, rectangular mailbox with a hinged lid, nothing out of the ordinary. But as I was working on it, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The more I looked at my design, the more it seemed to take on a sinister quality. The lines seemed to twist and warp, the angles became harsh and jagged. I tried to ignore it, telling myself it was just my imagination running wild. But then, strange things started happening. I would catch glimpses of my mailbox design out of the corner of my eye, even when I wasn't working on it. It would appear on my computer screen, flickering in and out of existence. I tried to delete the file, but it always reappeared somehow. Then the nightmare started. I would dream of my mailbox, its lid opening and closing with a sickening creak. Inside, I could see a dark void, a portal to some unknown horror. I would wake up screaming, drenched in sweat, my heart pounding in my chest. I tried to tell my friends about it, but they just laughed it off, saying I was being silly. But I knew something was wrong. I could feel it in my bones. The mailbox was haunting me, tormenting me even. One night, I couldn't take it anymore. I snuck into the school and made my way to the computer lab. I found my mailbox design and deleted it, this time making sure it was gone for good. I breathed a sigh of relief, thinking that would be the end of it. But then it wasn't. The next day, I received an email from an unknown sender. It was a picture of my mailbox, the one I had designed, only this time it was real. It was sitting in front of my house, its lid open, a dark void within. 
I tried to delete the email, but it kept coming back, no matter how many times I tried. I knew then that I had made a terrible mistake. The mailbox was more than just a design, more than just a nightmare, it was real. It was also coming for me. I tried to warn my friends and my family, but they didn't believe me. They thought I was crazy. Now I sit here, writing this, knowing that it's only a matter of time before the mailbox claims me. I can feel its presence, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to strike. I honestly don't know what it wants, or why it chose me, but I know one thing for certain. I will never be able to escape the terror of my mailbox. One day in shop class, we had to make mailboxes. It was supposed to be a simple project, but something about the task fell off. As I started cutting the wood and hammering the nails, a strange feeling crept over me. I decided to make mine unique, so I added a small lock to the door. It was a simple mechanism, but it made me feel secure. Little did I know that this lock would be the key to a nightmare. As the days passed, I noticed that my mailbox was the only one with a lock. It made me feel special at first, but then I started getting strange notes inside. They were cryptic, saying things like, the key is the answer and unlock the truth. I tried to ignore them, thinking it was just a prank, but then the notes started appearing in my locker, my backpack, and even under my pillow at home. I was being watched. I tried to tell my parents and my teacher, but they just laughed it off, saying it was probably just a joke. But I knew better. I could feel the danger lurking around every corner. Then one day, I found a note that said, the key is in the mailbox. I was terrified, but I knew I had to face whatever was waiting for me. I unlocked my mailbox with trembling hands, and inside, I found a small box. I opened it, and inside that was a single key. It looked just like the key to my mailbox, but it was different somehow. I held it up to the light, and that's when I saw it. The key was engraved with a single word, truth. Suddenly everything clicked into place. The notes, the lock, the key. It was all part of a twisted game, and I was the main player. I looked around, and that's when I saw him. A man in a dark coat, watching me from the shadows. He smiled, and I knew that this was just the beginning. I ran, but it was too late. He had already won the game, and now, I was trapped in a nightmare that I couldn't escape. Back in the 7th grade, I had a pretty big crush on this one girl. Her name was Emily, and she had the most beautiful green eyes and a smile that could light up the darkest room. We shared a few classes together, and every time I saw her, my heart would skip a beat. One day, Emily and I started talking more. We would walk home from school together, and she'd tell me about her day. I honestly felt like the luckiest guy in the world. One afternoon, as we were walking, she mentioned that she had a secret mailbox at the end of her street. It was a little red mailbox, hidden among the trees, where she would leave notes for her friends. I thought it was the cutest thing, and I couldn't wait to see it. So the next day, I decided to surprise her by leaving a note in her secret mailbox. I wrote a short message, telling her how much I liked her and how I hoped we could be more than just friends. I felt nervous and excited as I slipped the note through the mailbox slot. The next day, I waited for Emily at our usual spot, but she didn't show up. I was worried, so I decided to check her secret mailbox. As I approached the little red mailbox, I noticed something strange. The mailbox was open, and there was a note sticking out. I pulled it out and read it. I know what you did. You thought you could hide your feelings, but I saw everything. Now it's my turn to play. Meet me at the old abandoned house on Elm Street at midnight. Don't tell anyone, or things will get ugly. Reading that, my heart sank. I had no idea what to do. I thought about telling someone, but the note said not to. So, against my better judgment, I decided to go to the old abandoned house. As I approached it, I could feel the chill in the air. It was a cold dark night, and the house looked even more sinister than usual. I walked up to the door and knocked. There was no answer. I tried the handle, and the door creaked open. The inside of the house was pitch black, and I could barely see anything. I called out for Emily, but there was no response. I started to feel uneasy, like I was being watched. I walked further into the house, and that's when I saw it. In the middle of the room, there was a figure. It was Emily, but she looked… different. Her eyes were wide and unblinking, and her skin was pale. She was holding a knife, and there was blood on her hands. I tried to run, but it was too late. Emily lunged at me, and everything went black. 
The next morning, the police found me unconscious in the abandoned house. They said it looked like I had been attacked by a wild animal, but I know the truth. It was Emily, or whatever that thing was that looked like her. To this day, I still wonder if she ever really existed, or if it was all just a big nightmare. One time when I was sick as a kid, I had this truly bizarre fever dream revolving around mailboxes. It started off innocently enough, with me wandering down a street lined with houses, each with their own mailbox standing guard at the end of the driveway. But as I walked, the mailboxes began to change. They grew larger, their lids opening and closing like hungry mouths, their flags waving like arms beckoning me closer. I tried to run, but the mailboxes surrounded me, their metal bodies clanging together in a cacophony of noise. I stumbled and fell, and as I looked up, the mailboxes loomed over me, their shadows stretching out like long, spindly fingers ready to grab me. And then, in the blink of an eye, I was inside one of the mailboxes. It was dark and cramped, and I could hear the other mailboxes outside, their voices whispering and chattering. I tried to push open the lid, but it was locked tight. Panic set in as I realized I was trapped, and the mailboxes outside began to laugh, their voices echoing in the small space. I don't know how long I was in there, but eventually I woke up, drenched in sweat and gasping for air. The dream had felt so real, and even now, years later, I can't look at a mailbox without feeling a shiver run down my spine. I have this very vivid memory as a kid of going shopping with my parents for a new mailbox for our house. I honestly have no idea what happened to our old one, or why I went with them on the shopping trip. It was a chilly autumn evening, and the sky was already darkening as we drove to the hardware store. The store was nearly empty, with only a few other customers browsing the aisles. My parents seemed unusually tense, and I could tell something was bothering them. They kept whispering to each other, casting furtive glances around the store. I tried to ignore it and focus on the task at hand, picking out a new mailbox. As we walked down the aisle, my eyes fell on a mailbox that seemed to be calling out to me. It was old and weathered, with a faded red color that had seen better days. For some reason, I felt drawn to it, like it held some kind of secret. My parents seemed hesitant at first, but eventually they agreed to let me have it. We paid the cashier and headed back to the car. As we drove home, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. That night, as I lay in bed, I heard a scratching sound coming from outside my window. I tried to ignore it, but it grew louder and more insistent. Finally, I got up the courage to peek out the window, and what I saw chilled me to the bone. There, standing in the moonlight, was a figure in a tattered red cloak. It held a mailbox, the same one we had bought earlier that day. The figure seemed to be staring right at me, its eyes glowing with an eerie light. I screamed and ran to my parents' room, but when we returned to the window, the figure was gone. The mailbox, however, was still there, its red paint now bright and fresh. From that day on, strange things started happening around our house. Mail would disappear from the mailbox, only to reappear days later, sometimes with strange markings on it. We would hear whispers at night, and occasionally catch glimpses of the figure in the red cloak. My parents never spoke of it, but I could tell they were scared. I never found out what happened to our old mailbox, or why we had to get a new one. But I'll never forget the night we brought that cursed mailbox home, and the terror it brought with it. There was a period of several weeks to months when I was a kid that I was truly obsessed with mailboxes. I remember it vividly. It was during the summer when I was around 8 or 9 years old, and my family had just moved to a new neighborhood. I was fascinated by the variety of mailboxes in our street. Some were simple and small, while others were grand and ornate. One day, while I was out exploring, I came across a mailbox that looked different from the rest. It was old, rusty, and had a strange symbol on it that I couldn't decipher. Intrigued, I decided to check it out. As I approached it, I noticed that the lid was slightly ajar, and I could see a piece of paper inside. I reached in and pulled out the paper, which turned out to be a note. It was written in a child's handwriting and read, Help me, I'm trapped inside the mailbox. Please find my parents and tell them where I am. I was horrified and immediately ran back home to tell my parents. They didn't believe me at first, thinking it was just my overactive imagination. But I insisted, and they eventually agreed to come with me to check the mailbox. When we got there, the mailbox was gone. In its place was a small, empty patch of grass. My parents thought I was making it up, but I knew what I had seen. I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister was going on. 
From that day on, I started noticing strange things happening around the mailboxes in our neighborhood. Sometimes I would hear whispers coming from them when I passed by. Other times, I would see shadows moving inside the mailboxes, even though they were empty. My obsession with mailboxes grew, and I started collecting them. I would take them apart, trying to find clues about what was going on. But the more I learned, the more terrified I became. It all came to a head one night when I woke up to find a mailbox in my room. It was the same one I had found the note in, and it was open. Inside was a small, scared child, just like the one described in the note. I screamed and ran to my parents' room, but when we came back, the mailbox and the child were gone. There was only a small patch of grass where they had been. My parents finally believed me, and we moved out of the neighborhood shortly after. To this day, I still don't know what happened to the child in the mailbox, or what was going on in our old neighborhood. But I'll never forget the terror I felt, and the obsession that consumed me. A few weeks after I moved into my first apartment, I stumbled across this old abandoned building in the woods behind where I lived. It was a strange sight in the middle of the forest, its walls covered in moss and vines, windows broken and doors hanging off their hinges. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to explore the building. As I stepped inside, the musty smell of damp wood and decay filled my nostrils. The floor creaked under my feet, and I felt a chill run down my spine. I wandered through the building, taking in the sight of old furniture, broken glass, and cobwebs. It was clear that no one had been here for a long time. As I was about to leave, I noticed an old mailbox next to the door. It was rusted and covered in dirt, but it still had a name on it, Mr. Jenkins. I couldn't help but wonder who Mr. Jenkins was and why he left his mailbox here. I decided to take it with me, thinking it would make a nice addition to my apartment. Back in my place, I cleaned up the mailbox and placed it in my living room. It looked great, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I had made a mistake. That night, as I lay in bed, I heard a soft creaking sound coming from the living room. I tried to ignore it, thinking it was just the wind, but the sound grew louder and more persistent. I got out of bed and made my way to the living room. The creaking sound was coming from the mailbox. I watched in horror as the mailbox door slowly opened on its own, revealing a black void inside. Suddenly, a hand reached out from the mailbox and grabbed my wrist, pulling me towards it. I screamed and tried to break free, but the grip was too strong. The last thing I remember is being pulled into the mailbox, into a darkness that seemed to swallow me whole. I woke up in a cold sweat, realizing it was just a nightmare, but as I looked around my apartment, I noticed something strange. The mailbox was gone. The sun was setting on the horizon as I walked up to my mailbox. It was just another mundane day in my quiet suburban neighborhood. I wasn't expecting anything special in the mail, just the usual bills and junk. However, as I opened the mailbox, a glint of something shiny caught my eye. Nestled among the envelopes and flyers was a small, sleek box. My heart skipped a beat when I realized what it was, an RTX 3080 graphics card. I quickly grabbed the box and rushed inside, my mind racing with excitement. I had been waiting to upgrade my gaming rig for months, and this was the perfect opportunity. I really couldn't believe my luck. After setting up the new graphics card and booting up my favorite game, I was blown away by the performance. Everything looked and felt so real, it was like I was actually inside the game. But as the night wore on, I began to feel uneasy. Something about this whole situation just didn't add up. How did this expensive piece of hardware end up in my mailbox? Why did it feel like someone was watching me? I tried to shake off the feeling, telling myself it was just my imagination. But when I turned on the news the next morning, my fears were confirmed. Local man found dead in his home, police suspect foul play, the headline read. My heart sank as I realized the truth. The RTX 3080 had been a trap, a lure to draw me in and make me an easy target. I had been so blinded by my own excitement that I hadn't stopped to question the situation. Now I was paying the price for my carelessness. I had no idea who was behind this or what they wanted from me. But one thing was for sure, I would never feel safe again. When he was four, my little brother Justin made this drawing of a flying mailbox, and it ended up staying on our family's refrigerator for years. I imagine our parents had been planning to take it down, but it kind of morphed into this running joke. We'd laugh about it every time we opened the fridge, imagining the mailbox soaring through the sky with letters fluttering out like confetti. 
But one day, the joke took a dark turn. It was a stormy night, and I was home alone. My parents were out at a dinner party, and Justin was at a sleepover with his best friend, I think. The wind howled outside, rattling the windows and making the old house creak. I was curled up on the couch with a book, trying to ignore the eerie sounds. That's when I heard it, a soft thud from the kitchen. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. I told myself it was nothing, just the wind knocking something over, but then I heard it again, louder this time. I couldn't ignore it anymore. I crept into the kitchen, my eyes scanning the darkness. And then I saw it. The refrigerator door was wide open, and the drawing of the flying mailbox was gone. Panic surged through me. I slammed the refrigerator door shut and backed away, my mind racing. How could the drawing be gone? It was just a piece of paper, and the fridge door had been closed when I last checked. I turned to run, but something stopped me. A soft metallic sound, like a hinge creaking. I turned back, my eyes widening in horror. The mailbox from the drawing was hovering in the air, just above the kitchen floor. It was real, and it was coming towards me. I screamed and tried to run, but the mailbox was faster. It flew at me, its little red flag waving menacingly. I could feel the wind from its wings as it got closer. And then, just as it was about to reach me, it stopped. It hovered in front of me, its metal body glinting in the moonlight. I could see the letters inside, fluttering like trapped birds. I reached out, my hand shaking, and pulled out a letter. It was addressed to me, in my little brother's messy handwriting. I tore it open, my heart pounding. Dear big brother, it read, I know you're scared, but don't be. The mailbox is just a friend. It wants to help us. It knows things, secret things. Just ask it a question, and it will give you an answer. But be careful, big brother. Some questions are better left unanswered. Love, Justin. I stared at the letter, my mind reeling. What did this mean? Was my little brother in danger? I looked up at the mailbox, still hovering in front of me. What do you want? I whispered. The mailbox didn't answer. It just opened its little door, and a single letter fluttered out. I reached out and took it, my hand shaking. The letter was blank, but as I stared at it, words began to appear, as if written by an invisible hand. Ask, the letter said. Ask, and I will answer. I swallowed hard, my mind racing. What should I ask? What secrets did this mailbox know, and what would happen if I asked the wrong question? I looked up at the mailbox, my heart pounding. What is your name? I whispered. The mailbox's little red flag waved, as if in approval. And then, in a voice that was soft and metallic, it answered, My name is Mail. For one of my birthday parties as a kid, my mom walked with me around our neighborhood so I could put my invitations in the mailboxes of my friends who lived here. It was a sunny day, and I was excited to hand deliver each invite. As we strolled along the familiar streets, I noticed something strange. One of the mailboxes we passed had a dark, oily substance dripping down in front of it. I pointed it out to my mom, but she just shrugged it off, saying it was probably just some spilled motor oil from a passing car. We continued on our way, but the sight of that mailbox stuck with me. It seemed to loom larger in my mind with every step we took. I tried to put it out of my head, focusing on the task at hand. I had just finished delivering the last invitation when I heard a faint rustling coming from the direction of the mailbox. I turned to look, and to my horror, I saw a long, spindly arm reaching out from inside the mailbox, its fingers clawing at the air. My heart raced as I watched the arm retreat back into the mailbox. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I grabbed my mom's hand and tried to pull her away, but she just laughed, thinking I was playing a prank. I tried to explain, but she wouldn't listen. As we walked home, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was following us. I kept glancing over my shoulder, but I saw nothing. When we got home, I tried to forget about the mailbox, but I couldn't. I had nightmares about it for weeks. Years later, I still think about that mailbox. I've never been able to explain what I saw that day, but I know one thing for sure. I'll never look at a mailbox the same way again. If you've ever taken a programming class, there's a good chance you created one of those text-based adventure games. We had to make one for our final project in AP Computer Science, and for some reason I chose to make mine about fighting this crazy mailbox monster. 
I don't know, it was my senior year and I was kind of already mentally done with everything. The game was simple enough. You, the player, would start in your neighborhood and navigate your way around, collecting items and fighting monsters to level up. The final boss? A giant, sentient mailbox that would taunt you with riddles and puzzles. I thought it was pretty clever at the time. I ended up getting an A on the project, and that was that. I graduated, went off to college, and forgot all about the mailbox monster game. That is, until one day, years later, when I was back in my hometown for a visit. I decided to take a walk down memory lane and stroll through my old neighborhood. It was eerie how little had changed, really. The same houses, the same trees, even the same mailboxes. And then I saw it. My old mailbox, the one that had inspired my game. It looked exactly the same as it did all those years ago. I chuckled to myself, remembering how I turned it into a monster in my game. I walked up to it, curious if it still worked. I lifted the little red flag, and it clicked into place. The story continues with the AI system, Grok, being activated and immediately being asked a question about the current date and time. Grok responds by providing the information that it is 11.20pm on August 3rd, 2024 CDT. The system then awaits further instructions or questions from the user. <laughs>